Australia versus the USA. It's a battle that's been raging in boats, on tennis courts and in the pool for years. But who builds the best muscle car? We're going to find out. We've assembled 10 iconic Australian and American muscle cars, old and new, for an all-out head-to-head -head contest. They're all legends, but only one will be crowned a winner. In the green and gold corner are the Aussie underdogs, Falcon GT, Monaro, Falcon Hardtop, Charger, and new HSV GDS. And in the red, white, and blue corner are the Yankee Challengers, Mustang, Camaro, Barracuda, Torino, and new Boss 302. Now the cars aren't the only legends we have here at Eastern Creek Raceway. To help us pick a winner, we've got V8 Supercar and Bathurst champs John Bow and Jim Richards, motoring journo and walking car encyclopedia Joe Kenwright, Australia's favourite petrol head Phil Walker, and rounding out the five, myself, Nathan Ponchard. Now you may have noticed that some of the muscle car big hitters aren't here, but there's method to our madness. We've chosen cars with a direct foreign rival in order to make this a genuine head-to-head -head contest. They're big, bad, tough. They've built reputations and they're muscle cars that make Australia and America proud. The judging criteria we'll use to decide a winner is based on a few basic things. Performance of intended function, engine and engineering, social influence, design advancement and styling, relative performance and competition pedigree, affordability and collectability, and of course, the X factor. So let's get to it. Ford Mustang was America's highest selling car of the 1960s. With a breakthrough design that paved the way for what would be known as the pony cars, Mustang kicked off and dominated the muscle car scene for years to come. The most desirable model, the Ford Mustang K Code. How right could that car be? Very collectible. It's still probably the purest of all the Mustangs. I don't think anybody dislikes a Mustang. Styling was paramount to the Mustang team, and the 66 K Code was undeniably one of the sexiest cars built in America. The Americans were being blown out of the water by imports like Volkswagen. They couldn't really beat the technology of the Europeans, but they could sure as hell outproduce them. Back in those days, they were the bee's knees. Mustangs have always been the start of the pony car era in the States, the start of the compact car. In America, they were about 3,800 bucks. KK today is still pulling 55, 70 grand. And by getting the production price down, they can offer this massive array of parts and components and body styles where you would never look at an import again. That Mustang was a global benchmark that determined cars for the next 20 or 30 years. From 64 and a half to the very early 70s. The styling was beautiful. After that, they got fat and flabby, just like most American cars did. It has that look to it that is timeless. Even today, yeah, they're still an attractive car. The interior, however, just wasn't as nice. Inside, it's clearly inexpensive. The little things that aren't quite the way you might like them, you accept because you know that that's the way they work. The K-Code was Mustang's high-performance model. It had a 289 cubic inch V8 with a heap of upgraded features, including pistons, carby and camshaft. With 271 horsepower at its disposal, it was no surprise that Shelby based his Mustang GT350 on the K-Code. The little K-Code shrinks in size when you drive it. That's always a good sign. It feels like a little sports car. Lower the high performance version of the day. 271 horse, drops to a twin Ford, Caco, the whole shoot and that. What do you want? That 270 horsepower feels like 400 horsepower. So it basically had the running gear of four speed 289. Because they made so many, the affordability was pretty reasonable. What can you say? Great car. The Mustang K-Code is the godfather of muscle cars. Sexy, powerful and affordable. Its Aussie relative, the 67 XR GT, sure has its work cut out. Australia's first muscle car, the XR Falcon GT, had a 289 cubic inch V8, the same as its American counterpart. 
the factory racing team, led by Harry Firth, entered two cars in the 1967 Bathurst 500. Finishing first and second, the GT began a new dawn for Ford in Australia. It was probably the most significant car of our generation. They were groundbreaking in Australia. They are unique and that's sort of where it all started. The GTHO would later come in and overshadow the XR GT, but its power and handling were undeniably strong for the time. And still today, it's great to drive. By 1966, the Falcon had become a very different car to the Mustang. The XR Falcon GT arguably was as significant as the Mustang. The Americans said, let's reject all of this European sophistication. Let's use the best of the American simplicity and give everybody a car they can only be able to dream about. Broke into two categories. You had the Falcon compact base cars, then you had the intermediates. Get into the Falcon GT and you could feel the fair lane in that car. It's ride and handling are more suited to our sort of roads. It's very Australian. And then they put the best of the Mustang performance gear into this Falcon and turn it into a sporty Grand Tourer. 289 Porsche big gearbox. It was just the best car you could buy in the day. That started our muscle car industry. Styling was perhaps not the XRGT's strongest point, but it did what it had to do. The styling was quite American. It had this sort of Coke model rear look on it, and it was massively impacting. It's like something from outer space. The first thing you notice when you get in them is the seats. To think that my HR is also a 67, those Ford seats might be just a tiny bit massively better. The first genuine GT was still an icon car. I do like the way it drives. It's got a lighter brake pedal. It was comfy and a cruiser, and a lot more modern than I thought it would be. It's got a beaut smooth engine. It handles well for the period. Put on the highway, Probably nothing better in the state. With only 695 produced, the 67 XR Falcon GT is highly sought after, and arguably even more so than the Mustang Keiko. Who one of those today is still an $80,000 car? I think the XR GT would be a good little investment. In my world, the XR GT is the most important car of the whole lot. The two cars that started the muscle car race. Without the Mustang K-Code or the XR Falcon GT, we may not have some of the performance cars we have today. Nearly 50 years on, both cars are still the envy of many car enthusiasts in both the States and Australia. Adopting Chevrolet's 350 cubic inch V8, the 1969 HT Monaro GTS 350 was Holden's answer to Ford's burgeoning muscle car portfolio. To me, a 350 Monaro was the biggest and the best. It's something that I've kind of always wanted to own. This car was as special as an HA was to Ford. Beautiful to look at. It's a good, muscly, ballsy car. And if I could take one home tomorrow, I'd be very happy. The original HK Monaro GTS 327 had already won Bathurst. So when the GDS 350 hit the road in 69 with an extra 50 horsepower, Ford understandably had to be wary. This ballsy looking car fueled an automobile race between Australia's two biggest manufacturers that is still raging, even in 2012. Who would have thought in the middle 60s that Holden was capable of turning their bathtub into a sporty car? I've always loved that generation of Monaro. And you could see the square lines of the Kingswood at the front, but then it all turned into flight beyond that. It's got lots of torque, so it pulls, you don't have to rev it, pull it gear early, it just chugs away. It's got that lovely V8 sound. Very docile, but also quite quick. The HT Monaro had our judges divided for several reasons. The first thing that you really notice is that it's heavy. Now, I like driving a truck. I can imagine driving one as Colin Bond did at Bathurst for 500 miles. Pretty big ask. The gearbox was heavy. Everything was just heavy. It had everything going for it. You look at the seat and it just looks like a bucket seat but it held you much better. This is an Australia versus the States competition, and JB summed it up best. Our engineers made seats to go around corners, and the American engineers made seats to go down freeways. All the judges could agree on one thing. The 1969 Holden HT Monaro GDS 350 is a collectible. The Monaro GDS 350 is collectible, but it probably hasn't reached the heights of obviously the HOs and the Falcons, and it probably a fraction more than it, but it's going to get there. Tough as nails. 
beautiful engine. It's got a, quite a heavy, clunky gearbox, but it's nice, it works well. Live axle in the back, leaf springs, which were invented for the horse and cart. I think they'll always be worth really good money. If you tweak the engine a little bit, you could kick the tail out. I think that thing would be absolutely awesome. The HT Monaro GTS 350 may have been a game changer, but its American equivalent, the 69 Chevrolet Camaro SS, had our judges salivating. Simply put, it was the best looking car here. The Monaro GTS was Holden's answer to Ford's XR GT, and across the Pacific, the Camaro. Chevrolet's answer to the Ford Mustang. The 69 Camaro was the ultimate package. Do you say Camaro, Camaro? I've always said Camaro. That is one of the best prepared cars and the nicest looking cars I've ever seen. It is a beautiful car. I absolutely loved the Camaro. It's the best of everything. They had to come up with something because Ford caught them sleeping. And for a Camaro to make an impression, they had to come up with something really special. And they did. With 14 engines from a 3.8 litre six cylinder, through to a 7-litre big block V8, the 69 Camaro had something for everyone. With 600 plus horsepower, the 7-litre ZL1 dominated on the track. And on the road, the standard Camaro was still a solid all-round package. You couldn't mistake the 69 Camaro for anything else but a muscle car. The Camaro was the gutsiest muscle car that you could buy. It just says muscle. Well, they're a beautiful car to drive. I think they're a very balanced car. The Camaros had power steering mostly. Got plenty of power, got a really nice gearbox. And the American power steering is very light. Just a nice car to drive. So whilst it makes it very easy to drive, it's not easy to place because it's very light. The Camaro's power and performance were not its only desirable features. This beast had looks to kill. It looks beautiful, you know, it's tough but elegantly detailed. I think the styling's awesome. There's no doubt that for that brief period between 65 and 1970, GM was leading the world in styling. It almost felt like a modern car, but an old car skid. And this Camaro, the 69, had elements of the gullwing Mercedes in it. They were the car to have in the day. With so many produced over the years, the Camaro SS is not as rare or valuable as the Monaro GDS 350, but that doesn't mean it's not a collectible. The Camaro, in various specs, is quite affordable. Lots of them have been imported over the years, and certainly not as collectible as a 350 GDS Monaro. I just thought that car was a beautiful motor car. It's quite a lot different to the Monaro and that it doesn't have to be everything to everybody. Those headlights and that grill and that Coke bottle hip and the slip tail lights and everything, it's just... Hot Wheels perfection. With a roaring presence and looks to kill, the 69 Camaro SS was a head turner in the late 60s and even today. The Monaro GDS 350, on the other hand, might look more subtle, but its legacy may just last an extra bit longer. Muscle car era dominated by big V8s, the 1972 Chrysler Valiant Charger E49 really was a unique car. The E49, I think, is, uh, is a much, much better car than it's ever been given credit for. That is a unique car. It's such a sweet car to drive. I think that car really pushes the boundaries, really. They were a great car for what they were built for. I like the car, I love it. An E49, equipped with the race spec 265 cubic inch Hemi six pack, could clock the quarter mile in 14.4 seconds. A rare achievement in the early 70s, especially from a car that probably shouldn't have existed. Another great Aussie innovation where they took the best of what was available to them and had to make it fit with tiny Australian volumes and very limited budgets. The Charger was a six on the car in an era of where the V8 was king. It could have won Bathurst, it should have won Bathurst, it would have done so probably in 72. They really tried hard to make that car do the job and I think that is the reason for me that, uh, that I, I really think it's a unique car in the whole history of muscle cars. Uncle Phil may not have loved the Charger. They're temperamental, they sound terrible, they don't start first go and all this sort of thing. So I like things to do things real quick and nice. But even he had to admit that 40 years on, the E49 still drives brilliantly. 
Beautiful car to drive. That's where it excels. I love driving it. It's got a beautiful feel. It's got a lovely balance. The steering's non-powered, but actually has feel. Makes a fantastic noise. You can't fault it. You know, when you consider the age of that car, it is very, very good. Felt really, really good. As good as anything there, if not, if not the best. Some may argue that the E49 should have had a V8 version. Would I like it better with a V8? Probably. But as it is, the E49 is a very desirable and collectible car. But I still love the engine and I still love its point of difference. It's collectible and it's worth quite good money. I think they are just as collectible as an HR. Because of the uniqueness, because of the triple webs, the six cylinders and that, it is beautiful. I love one. I'd love one. The Charger never actually won Bathurst, which it was built to do, but it still remains an Australian favourite. The 1971 Plymouth Barracuda 426 Hemi was built with the same intention, to rule the track. The Barracuda is like Americana as we know it. I don't think it's ever reached the heights that perhaps they wish that it had. The Hemi's the engine to have. Yeah, I thought the Barracuda was awesome. It's just so American. But it wasn't for everyone. Other than the look, it just doesn't do it for me. The Barracuda wasn't a favour of mine. There's just too many of them. Two things stand out with the Hemi Cuda. It's looks and that engine. These cars had new generation seven litre engines. The seven litres that we saw in the late 50s, early 60s were big heavy engines that were developed for full chassis cars. Well, we started to see this smarter casting, smarter way of building these engines to where you could put them into the pony cars and the ones just above them. I had the 426 Hemi, which is probably one of the best engines ever made. Just awesome. You can see the Chrysler lineage in there and then you lift up this bonnet and there's this exotic Hemi V8. How good is that? Driving the Cuda was up for debate. Some of the judges liked it, some didn't. You go around the corner, you slide off the seat, the steering's got absolutely zero feel. It's a straight line hero. When you sat in the E49 and then got out and sat in the Barracuda, almost identical, but totally different. But just like getting in a boat. It was fun, it was good. But if there was ever a car built with just presence in mind, it was the 71 Cuda. I think it's a beautiful looking car. I love the toughness about it. I like that Hot Wheels 70s style that the car has. The interior is I know and you're as nice as the Chargers, but because the engine makes up for it every time. The shape is fantastic. I love the body shape. I like the look of it. I think the styling is terrific. Intimidating, powerful and attention seeking, the Cuda was one of the most striking cars here. Good engine. The slapstick gear shit, was, that was fantastic. That's a gimmicky thing, but a thing you love. It's, you know, a big rear tied, skinny front tied, bum in the air, drag car. Didn't stop, but it went around corners. The enormous grunt and the Chrysler torque flight automatic, even at that stage, was still a legendary transmission. And it was a standout. Two cars, built to win, built to impress. But two cars that failed to live up to their makers' expectations in both Australia and America. Today, though, they're beautiful muscle cars worthy of legend status. In the States, bigger is often better, and they don't come much bigger than the Ford Torino. The 1970 Ford Torino 429 Super Cobra Jet had our judges' tails wagging. Well, all except one. Torino I like, mainly because of the badge that said 429. For 69, that was groundbreaking. It just has this beautiful combination of sophistication and sportiness. As a car, it was a great car, but not for sure. The Torino may look like the Australian XA Falcon, but the main difference is the Torino was designed three years before. Sure, one was bigger, but the way they designed it, you can see that that one was, was mimicked on, on the other one. I personally loved the way the car looked. I've been told that I'm wrong, but I think the Torino's awesome. And with its 429 V8, it didn't feel like it was overpowered. It's potentially the worst packaged car in the world. For something that long, it has almost no rear seat room. Um, your knees are right up on you. You can barely see over the split bench in the front. And it shakes as you drive it. And it's big mother of a car. The Torino is as American as they come. Big, 
Loud, ostentatious, and with a big block V8, there was no missing this puppy. The engine is mighty and awesome. It made the GT feel soft. Imagine your bragging rights at a pub saying, I've got a 429. You know, like how big's that? It's big. Uncle Phil is not a big car person. I'm not a big car person. I like to feel like I'm part of the car. You sat in it and you drove it, but you never felt part of it. Even he had to admit that looks can be deceiving. Beautiful car mechanically. It drove great for a big car. I thought it would be a revless, talky, lead-tipped arrow of a thing. But when you seen it, you thought, oh my God, this is going to be huge and cumbersome, and it really wasn't. Here we think GT351 is the ultimate, and you drove that Torino with that big block motor, and all of a sudden it made a GT feel soft. A seven litre big block in the front of that thing doesn't feel like you've got seven litres of big block out there. You know, it gets up and goes, and you get this real sort of oral sound of the engine and the shaker and, the, you know, it's a muscle car. The Ford Torino was America's next generation of muscle car, large and loud. The XA Falcon GT may have been inspired by the Torino's design, but it was a completely different package. After media outcry about Australia's 160 mile per hour supercars put a stop to the development of the Phase 4 Falcon, Ford secretly installed some Phase 4 parts into the regular XA GT under the option code RPO83. It was the first unique to Australia Falcon. It's important. It's undoubtedly collectible. You took the best of America and the best of the Europeans and developed their own car. The X8 was the start of the next era of car. A beautiful car and modern. It may not have been a homologation special, but that doesn't mean it's of less significance than other performance cars of the day. This is a classic example of the options game. It meant that you could put certain combinations of parts to create something that was a little bit or a lot better than the cooking version of the car. In hindsight, it was a fabulous car. It was a nice car, very nice car, and I, I could have that car very easily. And for Ford at the time to build a two-door car, I'm sure it was in answer to the Monaro. Being of the new generation of muscle car, you would expect a smoother ride from the XA GT. It drove more like a modern car than the other ones. Very nice car to drive, very balanced, got European touches in it. Nice steering wheel, nice drive position. I don't think it has the balls and muscle of the XY Phase 3. Unfortunately for the car, when you've got other engines like the Hemi and the Cobra Jet, the 351 actually seems a little bit mild-mannered. I got in that car and felt like I'd driven it for years. It has a more European feel inside with the toggle switches, the wraparound cockpit feel, the really grabby bucket seats. And you can start to see how we were charting our own course. But it's not my favourite. It goes quite well and they had quite good success. John Goss won Bathurst. Very good any of the RPO stuff because there was only a few of them made. It probably arrived three years too late and I think XAGT was probably overlooked at the time because of its fairly soft styling. The Torino, which was the other Ford that it compared against, you can't see anything behind the steering wheel. Whereas in the Aussie car, it's sort of got that full aircraft dash. Probably needs more rear rubber on it though. The XA Falcon GT RPO 83 and the Torino Super Cobra Jet are hardly inconspicuous and they could be heard from over a mile away. They were muscle cars in the true sense. Big cars that were as tough as they were loud. Style, sound, power and performance have always been the core of a muscle car. And the new 2012 Ford Mustang Boss 302 has done its best to replicate, yet modernise, all of that. Paying homage to the original Mustangs of the 60s, the Boss 302 has recreated the American muscle car. Instantly reminded me of a 6970 Boss 302. When you sit inside it, it feels a bit like a retro car. Retro styling, I love that. It looks a bit like the 60s cars on steroids. It recreates the period that we're talking about better than HSV. The 331 kilowatt, five litre Coyote V8 hurls the boss down the standing quarter mile in just 13 seconds. 
The new boss is all muscle. Isn't it funny how they name engines after animals? I don't know if they use the term kitten for an engine. That was a joke. It delivers six litre power from five litres because of its magnificent breathing. The engine's a nice linear engine. Please, Ford, put that motor in an XR8 tomorrow. The steering wheel, position to get everything was, was really, really nice. It was a beautiful car to drive. Really nice gear change, um, great race seats, and the engine is superb. And the sound, sensational. I love the sound of it. I mean, the sound was just awesome. I said that the Mustang's exhaust sounded a little bit like a Ferrari's got laughed at. It has this crackle to the exhaust, even at moderate revs. The Mustang sounds phenomenal. Despite all of that, you still feel it's a cheap car. At Australian prices, you can't take it seriously. I thought it was a little bit cheap inside as far as plasticky and that. We're still in a mid-2000 Mustang interior. It's not the flashiest place in the world. I like the car. I just didn't like it as much as the GTS. I probably like the HSV a little bit better. Its overall package is very good. It's got good brakes, good transmission, good engine. You could very happily live with one, for sure. It's got good grip, it's got big tyres, which I like. It's got two eight fives on the back. At double the price, I would go for the HSV. I like the front, but I don't like the back. You looked at it, the retro side of it was fantastic. And I love the looks of it. The Boss may be the new king in the States, the best muscle car around. But in Australia, the HSV GDS rules the streets. It's the biggest and baddest Australian muscle car today. It's tough and imposing, even a little brash. But it's easy to drive, comfortable, and best of all, affordable. I love the current HSV. It's a really good car. World class. Thought, thought to yourself, gee, I'll go and buy one of these. As much as I hate to say this about a Holden, I'm impressed. The very best structure and strength that you could build for Australian conditions, all of it comes together in a package that there's no equivalent of anywhere in the world. Faultless, beautiful, and for the money, couldn't, couldn't ask for anything better. And it's drive. Great Corvette derived engine. It's fast, it's nimble, it turned to a stop, but it did everything great. For an 1850 kilo car, that thing has such good balance and handles so well. It's got a great engine, it's just a really good car. Gee whiz, it was, it was really, really good. It's awesome. The HSV GTS is exceptional value and ridiculously good on the road, but there was some controversy. It was absolutely sensational, but as a car to look at, it was absolutely awful. And I cannot begin to understand why they are designing an HSV with a goatee beard that makes the thing look like a block of flats at the front. I think the front of it's dead ugly. It's the ugliest front of a car I've ever seen in my life. But it makes a statement. If you've got one of those, no one's ever going to think you've got something else. The rest of it I quite like. I like the little vents in the front yards. I like the wheels. So I could live with the, with the ugly front. But they have forgotten that muscle cars look horizontal and wide on the road. For half the price or a quarter of the price of some of the German cars, I'd go and buy one of these. That car is amazingly competent. I enjoyed driving it and it was fun. It seats four or five people. It rides as well as it handles. Great seats. Not for its styling details, but you know, for its engineering, it's, it's awesome. Two modern day titans. Two cars that have taken completely different paths to be the current muscle car kings. In terms of style, they may not be everyone's cup of tea, but they have performance and character to rival the greats of the past. And if you were given the keys to these beasts, it would be almost impossible to say no. Deciding on a winner from 10 of the most legendary cars Australia and America have ever produced was never gonna be easy. 10 great engines, looks to die for, trendsetters, race winners, champions on the track and on the road. They're all icons and they're all brilliant in their own way. But we promised you a winner. And after much deliberation, the winner by a nose, 1966 Ford Mustang K-Code Fastback. It's a classic that still turns heads and to this day, still awesome to drive. That is a beautiful, 
Beautiful little car. I don't think you could pick anything else. If it wasn't for the Mustang, the muscle car war in America and in Australia wouldn't have been anywhere near as successful or may not have even ever happened. The Mustang was the start of a romance of high performance cars. It just set a blueprint that was impossible not to follow. We wouldn't have had the XRGT, we wouldn't have had the Monaro, we wouldn't have had the E38. Everything started from that Mustang. I don't think the impact of that can be ignored. Mustangs have been around since 64 and they've never had one year out of production, so it says it all. So a Yank was victorious, but after winning three out of five contests, I can proudly say Australia builds the best muscle cars. They were close calls and really unanimous, but that's testament to just how awesome these 10 cars are here. It could have gone either way, it really could. We were all in agreement that that's the way it should be. Well, considering that we have a Tasmanian, a Kiwi, and three Aussies, someone's going to think we're being biased. The Americans started the muscle car era, no question about that. But I think Australia refined it. A muscle car in Australia had to do everything. They can carry four people. They can pound a dirt road. They can do the shopping. In the US, a muscle car could be a, an indulgent purchase. I think the Aussies surpassed the American cars. It wasn't an easy decision, but it was a right decision. They put on the Aussies. So there you have it. The American 66 Mustang K code is the muscle car king, but Australia builds them best. We hope you've had as much fun watching this film as we've had making it. This is Ponch, signing off for Unique Cars.